Hi everybody, I'm Jeff Gottlieb. This is Earth Skills on Mountain Stream TV. And uh, this week, or this, this session, I have a guest. Uh, when studying Earth Skills and learning about our relationship with the Earth and uh, how to live sensibly in a way that, that, uh, you know, that suits us and is ecologically responsible, uh, one of the, the greatest treasures that I have towards that is my friends and the people in my community that I talk to about projects and ideas. And one of my favorite people to do that with is Becky Beyer, who's on with me today. Mm -hmm. And Becky and I go way back with uh, carving wooden spoons and uh, crafting various things and also just gabbing away about plants and how to use them. And that's what she's on to talk about today. So I'm going to turn it over to Becky to start by telling us about... Um, how, how you got here, how you got to this point to where um, you're able to teach others about plants and how we use them and, and uh, what kind of projects you're involved in right now. Yeah. So you want to tell us about how you got started in this and how we got to here. Definitely. Well, I'm Becky Beyer and I live in Asheville. Well, technically Barnardsville, 20 minutes north of Asheville. And uh, I started out by studying um, agriculture. So <laughs> I realized when we were pulling out weeds that most of them were probably edible or medicinal or had other uses. Maybe you could make fiber out of them. You were the person who first taught me how to make cordage uh, probably seven years ago <laughs> when we first met. And I got more and more interested in not just herbalism, but how do you make stuff and do things with plants? Because it seemed like, you know, you really don't need to buy a lot of stuff if you can just make it out of plants. So, I'm cheap, and it also <laughs> works out well that way. So, um, I started studying uh, herbalism, and I took an apprenticeship with Natalie Bogwalker at Wild Abundance, which is a school um, in Weaverville, North Carolina, uh, for primitive skills. And it was, it was nice learning from another woman, who I have lovely male teachers in my life, too. Um, and I got more and more excited about the topics and just kept learning more and more. And then I lived outside in a single pole tent for a year and a half <laughs> and got to practice a lot of what I preach. And I started teaching workshops. People would say, hey, can you teach a spoon carving workshop? You're 25. We don't have to pay you a lot. Can you come teach this? <laughs> and I started teaching more and more. And I realized I was actually pretty good at, at teaching. So I didn't have to be that good at the, at the skill itself. But if you can show someone how to do it, that's kind of a skill unto itself. Yeah, and if you so, know a little more about it than they do, you yeah. can at least help them to get a little better than they have than they are. Yeah, because I feel like there's a lot of people who are way more knowledgeable than I am in the many things that I teach, because I can't pick one topic. So as you know, so I teach everything from Appalachian folk medicine to spoon carving to kudzu basket weaving to I don't know so many things, but. I started my master's degree at Appalachian State University uh, in 2015, and I'm going to hopefully finish it this year. <laughs> and I've created a database at AppalachianEthnobotany.com that is a living bibliography of the uses of plants in Appalachia. So that's my current big project. That's a giant project. <laughs> There's just so many plants and so many uses and so many traditions that come from that that's true. I imagine you could be plugging information into that thing until you're 150. It's true, and I've put a call out on my website. If people have resources they want to share, they can just email them to me, and I'll put them on the website. Super. Mm -hmm. So, what what are some things that you're that you're doing with plants? I know you and I like to get together and pick a project and do a thing. Last mm -hmm. time we were cracking cracking black walnuts and extracting them because they're just absolutely amazing. And cookies and every other sort of oh, sort yeah. of thing. So. Um, what are, what are some ways that your, your projects help you live? That's a good question. Right now, I'm always working on carving projects. And I've been getting a lot of emails about, when are you teaching a carving class? So right now I'm trying to finish a bunch of spoons. And obviously I use the wooden things that I make every day to eat from and cook with. You know, I use the baskets I make to store stuff and move things. And sometimes I even sell them, which is nice because it helps support my livelihood. And I eat wild food every day, and I, my main job, my 9 to 5, is being a foraging instructor. <laughs> so 
my dad always said, what are you going to do with a degree in agriculture? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, Dad. I guess it was to be a, a professional forager. So <laughs> I do go. eat something wild every day. Just like our esteemed friend who passed, Frank Cook, used to say. Was that his big slogan? Yeah, the, Mark yeah, Williams has perfect. kind of kept it alive. Our, our fellow ethnobotanist friend, who's fantastic, eats something wild every day. That's something I really appreciate about our community of people, is how we attribute what we learn. How we're, we're really quick to say, well, I learned this from Frank Cook. Or I, you know, I studied with so-and-so, yeah. and, you know, we there's a lot of very refreshing humility yeah. among the people that we hang out with. And yet, if you just met that person that says, oh, yeah, I don't know much. I learned it from other people. You'd be astonished at <laughs> how skilled they are and how knowledgeable they are. And uh, also, I see a lot of people that are quite young who are already making their mark. They're already, like, at least... Like Todd Elliott. Like Todd Elliott. Yeah, with his and, new book that just came out about uh, mushrooms in the absolutely. southeast. Yeah. yeah. So uh, how old is he? Twenty five? Twenty four? He's so young. Something like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, colleges were trying to recruit him when he was like sixteen and seventeen because <laughs> he was already doing world class research on yeah. mycology. Yeah, so these are the kind of these are the kind of kids we hang around with and what kind of grown ups they grow up to be. Um, can you can you tell our viewers more about what is foraging, and you know, why would you do it, mm -hmm. and why would you do it instead of just buying everything in the store? And <laughs> yeah. Stuff. I mean, they're all, they're all long, useful explanations about why totally. we do all this crazy stuff. Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's hard to explain the joy of going outside and picking something up off the ground and eating it and not be, it's not a bad thing. You're like, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> this isn't a bad thing. It's free food that is often much more nutritious than grown food because our wild plants have to put their dukes up to defend themselves constantly from predators, disease, whereas our grown foods, we coddle them and protect them like a helicopter parent from any type of stress. So they don't create the same types of chemicals, which are actually really good for us. And um, example, dandelion, probably 10 times more nutritious than spinach in vitamin A, vitamin C, mineral content, potassium, it just wins in every court, knocks it out of the park. So for me, number one, nutritious, it's really fun. <laughs> you get to run around outside and find your dinner. It's delicious. Wild food tastes great. I think there's a kind of mythology that wild food tastes like dirt or <laughs> isn't yummy, but I mean, we do, um, the company I work for is called No Taste Like Home. NoTasteLikeHome.org. You can go on foraging tours with us. We also teach classes on nut processing, wild foods as medicine, medicinal mushrooms, and all other types of wild forage cocktails. There you go, right? You can wild forage cocktails. Not necessarily the healthiest way to ingest wild food, but <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, we're just obsessed with all things wild food because, like we said, we do think it's something that everyone should be able to learn how to do. And I do also teach a couple free foraging workshops every year because I think it is a human right to know how to forage and that it was once something we all did together you know it was normal yeah it was yeah. like every day you would do that and some people still have relatives that do or did that they remember that foraged and in southern Appalachia we have such a strong history of classic foods like poke mm -hmm. phytolaca americana one of our favorite native plants used for everything poison food dye ink um, all types of stuff, and, you know, making ramps and things like that. There's these wonderful legacies of history. So maybe that's your fourth or fifth reason, is the continuity of history and the preservation of things that are truly valuable. So it's free, it's fun, it's nutritious, and it's a beautiful piece of history that all humans share in common, which how many things do we have that all of us share? I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, but just our bodies, the physiology that makes us human. Mm -hmm. but we tend to downplay it because it runs automatically. Yeah. You don't have to pay attention to say, I, I, I better digest now. <laughs> yeah, just thank much. God. That yeah. isn't something else. Right, I'm a little busy. Is. I don't have yeah. time for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I think a lot, a lot of people are interested in foraging, but they're scared mm. to get started because what if I identify something wrong? Do you have any suggestions for people to just get their feet wet a little bit mm -hmm. and get started. 
I mean, I have some things I tell people, but I'm just wondering what kinds of things. Yeah. Because, you know, you meet somebody at a party or, and you start talking about these things and they say, whoa, I'm afraid I'll eat something bad that will hurt me. That's the number one thing people say to yeah. me. They're like, oh, you're going to die. I'm like, okay, I am, but not right now. From a right. Right. <laughs> yeah, so what do you tell a beginner to yeah. get them over their, their fear to just try a little something that's safe? Yeah. Well, I always tell people to not try anything unless you are with a human expert because just like online dating pictures can be deceiving right <laughs> so if you're looking at a photo online the times that people do get hurt which is very infrequently do people poison themselves um, if you think about it we have 1100 medicinal plants in this region 2500 plants in general and a large portion of those medicinal plants also have edible properties so we have a lot of things to know you only need to know about 30 to be, I think, to 30, take. 30 plants yeah. that you just put in your life and use yeah. them all the time? I think if yeah. you could just learn 30, that's a really reasonable number that gives you a diversity of experiences, you know? Like acorns, chickweed, dandelions, you know, some of the easy to yeah. identify. Um, but you really need to learn with a real person. And there's multiple ways to do that. You can take a class with you or with mm -hmm. me or one that we teach together. Or you can come and take a foraging tour with No Taste Like Home. It's a three-hour class, so it's a really good first. You can wrap your brain around something in three yes. hours. And you get, get to learn how to cook it. Whole day. Yeah. Oh, and you cook. We teach you how to, at the end, we'll show you how to cook it, so you can take it home and process it. And you get to take home a bunch of stuff, so cool. you get to practice safely. And then you have the actual plant you can compare to other plants. So it's really helpful. So I say that, or go to an earth skills gathering and take a class in a more community-oriented way like that. Or you can do a private apprenticeship with a, a experienced practitioner, or um, there's so many ways. Or you can come to one of my free classes if you have low, if you're low on funds and you feel like that's not something that's accessible to you. I do four free classes a year, and um, I always encourage people to try to do that in West Asheville. So you don't even have to have a car to get to it in our public parks. If you live in the Asheville. Yeah, area. if you live in Asheville, <laughs> but I'm sure there's people all over the country that forage, and um, you just have to kind of reach out and find them. Yeah, some people don't even know you call it foraging. Yeah. They don't some know they're foraging, they just... Yeah, wild crafting, wild harvesting, there's a lot of different words for it. When I was a kid, we just like, found the blackberry patch and went and ate blackberries. Yeah, we, we didn't did know that was that. foraging. Yeah, we, we just didn't went and ate the berries. Yeah, we have wine berries in New Jersey where I went to high school and started doing a little bit of wild food stuff and gardening. My first farm apprenticeship was in central New Jersey. People are like, oh, God, New Jersey. There's actually, like, beautiful farmland all you mean over the central Jersey. State? Like, oh, we are the yeah. third biggest producer of cranberries. I think the fifth of blueberries, you know. People don't think of it. We have that dark soil, really good for growing onions. Uh, but obviously, northern New Jersey is a small drop in a larger pond. Yeah. So, yeah, we ate berries and stuff like that, and cherries and things. Mostly fruits. Fruits are a good place to start, especially brambles. Thorns and segmented fruit. Usually you're pretty good on that. <laughs> Did other kids think you were weird when you were growing up just oh, like yeah. doing those things? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, people thought I was weird club. for a variety of yeah. reasons. <laughs> I was like really into like metaphysics. I was a Unitarian Universalist and at largely Christian school. So I and my uncle, my whole family was very multicultural. So I had a, a Muslim uncle from Morocco. I had a Jewish uncle. I had a born again Christian uncle. I had a very, very like interesting mix. And so when kids met me, I'd be like, it's Ramadan, you guys. Like, don't you know? They'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I think that definitely made me kind of weird. Or I'd be like, guys, it's, it's Lunasa. We need to, you know, the Feast of the Loaves. I'm like an eighth grader. People are like, you're so weird. <laughs> I was also I, one of those horse girls, so that's always a bad thing. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I was one of those kids as well. And, <laughs> and I, think, I think what that did was you, you quickly stopped trying to please everyone. <laughs> yes. Because I'm already, they don't know what I'm doing or why I'm doing it, so I might as well just keep on doing it because yeah. what they think about it doesn't change anything. Then people kind of think yeah. you're an anomaly and they're kind of like, actually, you're kind of cool because you're such a weirdo. Later on, they come back and go, you were we were kind of afraid of you in high school, but I get that sometimes. <laughs> we were just intimidated by you because you were doing really weird stuff all the time. Like, all right, all right, fair enough. So now you're... Um, you're going to finish your degree this spring. Yes. Yeah. I've been defending my thesis in April. And I'm so excited. Uh, part of my thesis is creating this encyclopedia of uses of plants in Appalachia. 
that, in my opinion, and I explain how in each section, to create small businesses that are sustainable with plants. So, example, kudzu. What are your favorite things to do with kudzu? Yay! You <laughs> might have seen my last show. I built my house out of the stuff. Um, Plus, I'm going to be teaching a wild basketry workshop at the Florida Earth Skills Gathering this coming week. And uh, Kudzu is my star performer when it comes to wild basket. This will be uh, vines in their rough form mm -hmm. to create baskets that are just as strong and tight as, as you know, fancy finished kinds mm -hmm. of baskets. But they have, a, they have a charm because they might have the, the tendrils still wiggling around in there and the leaves on them and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But they're, they're one of a kind and, you know. Everybody's everybody's most hated weed in the southeast makes so many useful things. Almost every part of it is edible. Uh, people always are shocked when I say, you know, you can eat the leaves of kudzu. I was doing a foraging walk in uh, at White Oak Pastures, which is a great grass-fed meat farm in Georgia. It made so much fun. Wow. And we afterwards did a dinner with the chef there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were some young kudzu leaves out, and I ate a few raw. Just and people were just like astounded that you could eat them. They have been told their whole lives. That this being is a bad being. Right, it's not right. good. It's I bad. have to hate the whole plant, so yeah. I can possibly make use of it. Yeah, and as a person in recovery from alcohol, I'm always really excited about kudzu because the root was used in Japan and still is in the research as a uh, as an extract for treating alcoholism. So it's kind of like I always think of kudzu. It does have ecological impact, but so do we. <coughs> and so looking at all the businesses that could be created, making the root starch, which is edible, and mm -hmm. Um, making jams and jellies from the beautiful flowers that kind of taste like grape Kool-Aid, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I love I walking around that. in early <laughs> September and going, It does kind of smell like jelly. It does smell like grape jelly. Yeah, unlike the bugs on the kudzu that smell kind of like cilantro. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, and then the vines are wonderful material for a variety of... You can make cloth, like silk with them. You can I'm make hoping to invite Nancy Basket to come and talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. her uh, paper making, her kudzu paper oh, making. Oh yeah, she makes all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And Nancy Baskets, who taught me how to make kudzu baskets, I always remember who taught me something mm. for the first time. Mm -hmm. And then you and I, one of the times I think previous when we went, last time we hung out, one time before we were making kudzu baskets last fall. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And um, I like to teach uh, like one or two workshops a year at my place over at the Hawk and Hawthorne in Barnardsville, where I live. But, um, yeah, I think about these things like kudzu, which is also a great animal fodder. High in protein. Yeah. Horses, goats, sheep, cows, chickens, they can all eat it. Rabbits. Rabbit, everybody likes it. And then um, plants like uh, black, wild blackberries. You know, they're strongly invasive, right? You can also make cordage with blackberries. You can make... What? Yeah. I'm the cordage guy. I've never... I'll show you I've how. I've never found just... fibers. In a blackberry plant. I, I can show you how to do it. <laughs> I'm about to to start controlling all the blackberry mm -hmm. plant property. So I well, next time I come by, I'll show you how to do it. And cool. I also made a blackberry basket um, that I need to, to show you. But these are the things I think you don't have to be literate. You don't have to have access to certain socioeconomic factors. Anyone can do these things if, um, if shown yeah. by an expert. And I think... You know, making, I think sometimes that as Earth Skills practitioners, it's kind of part of our responsibility to figure out how can we make this accessible, and the complicated portion is, and how can we sustain ourselves. And I think those things are really possible, and I'm finding out how to do them through time. And it's really exciting, a little scary, and a little, you know, but also I think a really uh, worthwhile endeavor. I think so. And I, I see that there's this dance that you're doing with serving others and making sure you're, you're taking care of yourself, mm -hmm. too. Um, One of the yeah. ways I've found best to do that is do donation-based classes. Okay, so Most people of my classes, will do what they can. And you know what? People really are generous. I teach classes that are three hours long, and I ask for 30 to to $100 donations. Mm -hmm. So I give a very wide price range, and many people give 30 because that's what's doable, but off, every once in a while someone will drop 100 <laughs> and it kind of makes my average around 50 person per class, which is amazing and very meets my needs. So I've been doing that for two years and I think I'll just continue with it because it really worked. I like it. Mm -hmm. And where, where are you located? If people wanted yeah. to say, wow, I want to find out more about those yeah. classes. How could I come to one? Where are they and yeah, how so would they learn about them? My website is blood and spice bush, spelled as it sounds, dot com. And I'm uh, Becky Beyer. If you search for my name. My interview on Rune Soup 
which is an occult podcast, will come up. Um, and my class lists are on the website. And I teach at the Hawk and Hawthorne, which you can find on Facebook, as an event center for the esoteric arts, foraging, wild foods, and gardening. So, it's pretty exciting. It yeah. is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, at your place, you have extensive gardens. Um, besides just growing standard vegetables like most gardeners yeah. do, are you using your gardens to kind of bridge between the commercial vegetables and wild foods? Definitely. How do you do that? So I teach a class called Growing Wild Foods, <laughs> and it's really fun. I actually end up transplanting a lot of things, just taking a little plant from the wild and bringing it home, obviously, of non-endangered or threatened plant species. A lot of people, when I'm giving tours, will say, oh, I tried to dig up this native orchid and put it in my yard. And I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> don't dig up the rattlesnake plantain or the crane fly orchids, because they really have a hard time with that. But certain plants, like Sochan, one of my favorite plants, um, I just dug up a little root. I cut the roots, took a little plant, took it home, and now I have this big patch of Sochan at my house, which is the green-headed coneflower, a traditional Cherokee food, a native plant. Um, I love it. I have it at my too. place, too. And, um, I put in a couple of little ones, and I was talking to our, our friend Oscar about yeah. what kinds of companion plants are good to grow with the... Uh, hazel bushes mm -hmm. that I got from him, and he said, well, he's planting sochan and uh, ground nut and a couple other things. And I said, my sochan is under so my chan. hazel. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, once you put it in, it's part of my herb garden where I have my my uh, my plants that tend to get unruly and out of hand. I think I remember where it is in your yard. I yeah. put them all next to each other so they can fight it out amongst themselves. <laughs> So I have the nettle next to the sochan, next oh, yeah. to the, the, the daylilies, next those, to yeah. the elderberries, next to the, the lemon balm. Yeah, no, those are all things we have in our garden, for sure. Although, unfortunately, I live with seven people, and one of them is the lawnmower, and he ran over all the elderberry bushes this year. So, <laughs> But luckily, they caught us pretty, pretty well. Pretty aggressive, so they, yeah. they came back, but we didn't get any elderberries. Okay. But yeah, we like to cut any lines between wild food and cultivated food, and Whatever we're excited about, we bring it in, and we're making more and more gardens this year. We actually, uh, next time you come visit me, you'll just see I cleared this huge area with the chickens, uh -huh. and um, just put straw and worm castings all over it, and have this big new flat garden area. I'm very excited about right next to my house. Do you have a specific like worm farm sort of thing where you're getting your castings from? Our friend Mike, one of the landowners, he picked them up, so I'm not sure who he got them from, but it okay. is a person. Somebody's who got a worm farm. Yes, and okay. they build up old. They recycle the bags from like soil and stuff, mm -hmm. so you just take your empty bags and they'll fill them for you. That's great. So they don't nice. even generate bag waste. But yeah, that's what we're doing. It never stops. There's yeah. always another good idea and another thing. And you, every time I, I ever talk to you, you've always got half a dozen things on the burner. You're always ready to do <laughs> this thing and that thing. As you know, I yeah. often double schedule myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we almost didn't make it here today to do this, but I'm, I'm so happy Florida, that we did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're both headed to Florida uh, mm -hmm. for different reasons. I'm on my way to teach at the Florida Earth Skills Gathering, which is a. Uh, we can see these gatherings started as kind of specifically being about primitive skills, kind of living history. Mm -hmm. How can I learn about history by doing the things that our ancestors like did? Like experiential learning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I want to understand stone tools, so I'm going to make stone tools so yeah. I can look at a 10,000-year-old artifact and understand something about the construction because I did it. Mm -hmm. So that's reconstructive archaeology. But, it's, but people started to really show that they were hungry for skills that they could use and it would help them in their life today. Like things that help you have a better diet or things that would teach you how to build a house with natural materials, you know. Mm -hmm. So some more practical things. So earth skills got coined. Now we have so, herbalism, first aid. We do, everything. Permaculture. Um, emergency um, medicine. like <laughs> Yeah, cob yeah. ovens and um, yeah. natural building. Games. And, right, yeah. primitive <laughs> toys and games. Yeah, so yeah, so... We, we still see those ancient skills, how people lived a long time ago, and how could you try it. And it's not like those things don't give you something you can use today. Sometimes we can't even explain exactly what it is. Let's say um, animal tracking. So 
yes, you needed to be a good tracker to be able to hunt a thousand years ago, especially if you're hunting with a spear or oh, yeah. something. Um, but if you study tracking, your, your own awareness about the world around you and your ability to see things, notice things, and remember things, it, it grows your brain. So sometimes those lines between, well, all these skills that we might see, what am I going to use them for? Don't worry about that. Yeah. Just, just get skills. It's there. a way to, yeah. to improve yourself in a way. Like, I become a so. better community member, become more aware. Even um, now we even have communication classes on how to speak to each other kindly and listen well. I think that's so important. That may be the most important skill, right? It is. And, uh, and sometimes I have to admit that I look at all of the different classes that are offered and I think, is that really an earth skill? Well, maybe that remains to be seen. <laughs> you do it, and then you see later if it was. There you go. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, what a great community of people, all kinds of learning going on. Uh, the, one of the things I like best about these gatherings is you're, you're perfectly welcome to sit and have meals next to the instructors and strike up conversations and talk about it. anything that comes up. Mm -hmm. That's some of the best, the best things about going to these gatherings is yeah. just, to, just to have conversations about your pet subjects. And yeah. I mean, I've grown so much in the skills that I do by just chatting people up at gatherings. Yeah, totally, me too. I mean, I, I, the first gathering I went to was Firefly, which happens in Asheville, North Carolina in the summer. This year it's June 22nd through the 24th, I think. I think that's right. And um, yeah. it's fireflygathering.org. And um, I wanted to carve a spoon. That was like the one thing. I was like, I always wanted to do this. And I met Baron Brown, who's a, one of our mutual friends, and he became kind of my spoon carving mentor. And then one year he was like, do you want to teach it with me? And then... The teachers at Earth Skills will help you bridge the gap between student and teacher yourself. And then, of course, you're always yeah. a lifelong student, but you can, they will definitely kind of, no one's like, you have to always be a student. I will always be a teacher. It's, it's constant. I love growth. that those lines are blurry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, how do you find out more about Earth Skills gatherings? Where can we go to look at them up? There actually is one clearinghouse of information. You can look at the website, earthskillsgathering.org. And our friend Grant Atkinson put this together quite a few years ago. He's hoping to up, update it, it but good. it really does have the contact information for all the different gatherings, where they are, when they are, how you can find out about them, and, and photos. Things you might like to, and <laughs> photos, lovely. Yeah. So, so we swear by it. Come to some of these gatherings, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, one or both of us are likely going to be there. And you can <laughs> yeah. you can sit down next to us at a meal and talk our ear off about That's edible true. plants or spoon making or, or wood choices or permaculture mm -hmm. or natural building or, 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 or just exactly. do it. So that was great. Well, this has been Earth Skills with Jeff Gottlieb and this week, lucky enough to have Becky Beyer. And uh, we will see you again, maybe out in the field. Bye.